just before we start. If you have not already, I highly encourage you to head over to the APSC 174 on Q site and wait until it eventually loads. Oh, incredibly slow. All right. Uh, test and, the test and exam information has been posted. There's an announcement about this, but just in case you didn't see it earlier, the midterm is, of course, running next Monday, so six days from now. And the main coverage is the coverage is a week's one to four. But uh, notice also that some of the questions from week five kind of bleed back a bit. So if you want a little extra practice, that's why I would think of this entry here, extra practice for the materials from week one to four. Um, it's proctor track, two hours to write the exam, plus the 30 minutes to upload. So a total of two and a half hours for the whole extravaganza. I know you guys went through 111 last night, or sorry, 112 last night. So uh, I hope that went smoothly for most of you. And solutions and blank exams or midterms from the last three years are also up there. Before we dive into today's material, which so today's material is not on the exams, not on the midterm, it's week five. Are there any questions about the midterm before we dive into this week's new material? <laughs> As <good. laughs> the variation in Proctor Track experience is quite broad. I've seen that uh, on the back end of the chat discussions. Yeah, some people it's like, yeah, three clicks and I'm in. And other people are like, why is not recognizing my camera for the first time ever? Anyway. All righty. Which was the midterm? Um, what percentage? That, I, I don't know off the top of my head. It's similar to old exams. Like we have some computation, 50, somewhere between 40 and 60. I think that's probably a reasonable ballpark. So a good chunk of. Some of it will be computational, but other parts of it will be proof. And 40 to 60 of each is probably a reasonable ballpark. And yes, sadly, no, no Casio 991s, unfortunately. Um, again, not something that is required for most of the calculations we've been doing that we've seen in this class so far. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why they do that. <laughs> uh, this has been a longstanding decision in the math department with this course, but anyway. Um, proof of vector spaces. That, that's probably getting into too much specifics. Um, but again, like I said before, the expectations would be for, let me see if I can flip over here. There we go. Uh, so if you're asked about a vector space, that's with the eight axioms, you would be, be given one or two, given one or two, and then asked to show them, then asked to show to prove that they apply for a certain space. The vector vector subspaces, that's just the three axioms. And that all three of them, if you look at old midterms, that's a fairly routine question as to here's a vector space. Make sure that it does or determine whether it does or does not satisfy the three axioms. That's pretty, yeah. Nah. The best guide as always is to look at the old midterms and you'll get a sense for the scale, the length and the types of questions that are asked. There's not a huge amount of variety, especially in the first four weeks of questions that we really can't ask. So hopefully that gives you the, that'll give you the best guidance, I think. Alrighty, uh, yeah. Uh, how many questions total? Five, five questions total. If you look at old exams, it's typically five or six. And I think this, this year we ended up with five. With multiple parts, of course, <laughs> part A, part B, that kind of thing. All righty, any other, thank you for those. Any other last questions about the midterm? Is there multiple choice? <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to laugh. Uh, but if you look at the old midterms, there is nothing resembling a multiple choice question in linear algebra. <laughs> it's just, it's not how we do it. Web work, we have to do that to get the uh, computer to market for us. But uh, when it comes to the real midterms, it's on paper, it's proving, it's writing everything out. For what it's worth, and I just, I'll throw this in just because it's on my mind. Um, 
I used to have another calculus class that was all written solutions. And then over the years, the students finally wore me down and said, okay, fine, we'll have some multiple choice section in it. The multiple choice section was always the lowest part uh, compared to the app, compared to the overall average on the midterm or the final exams. So be careful what you ask for is what I'm saying there. Multiple choice can be very unforgiving, unlike written answers where we're like, ah, you kind of tried, here's two marks. Um, that does not exist for multiple choice. So uh, you may, you may be happy. Well, I won't say you may be happy, but just be aware that if you ask for multiple choice and get it sometimes, it can actually lower the grades overall. All righty. Um, in the vein of preparing for the midterm, what I did is I took one of the practice questions from th that midterm just to give us a little warm up today and get into the feel of linear independence, vector spaces and all that, because it's been you know, three, four days since we've looked at this. So, if you take a look at this problem here, we're given three vectors, okay, that are elements of a vector space. We're told that two of them, when they're in a set, and again, linear independence is about a set of things, not individual things, or just the relationship. It's about individual, about a whole set of them. Uh, <laughs> do I have to turn off the name changing feature? <laughs> All right. Um, and then we have a second set, v1, v2, v3. Notice the key phrases here. This pair by itself is linear independent, whereas this triple is linear dependent. <laughs> uh, we're asked to show that if we have these two facts, then the third vector is in the span of, so this is in, is in the span of, v1, v2. And so hope, hopefully at this stage, if you've started doing some of your practice uh, for the midterm, you should have at least some sense of what kind of tools are going to be required for this, and maybe an intuition that this makes sense. So it's not always a great guide, but kind of like putting in numbers into functions as a way to at least get your head around things, drawing things in like R2 or R3 can be a start to this kind of question just to see if that makes sense. So I got V1 and I've got V2. They're linearly independent. So they're pointing in different directions. Then I add V3 in and they're linearly dependent when I include that in there. Well, that would be like anything in R2 here because what does it mean to be linearly dependent as a set? It means I can take one of the vectors plus some of the other vector and get the new vector V3. Or I can do it the other way. I can actually add V1s, I have to go back, V1s and V3s and get V2. So there's some kind of mutual uh, structure to those three vectors. The technical definition is that I can follow V1 for a while follow v2 for a while, then follow v3 for a while, and get back to the origin. There's some way to do a circuit with those three that isn't all zero. No, the question does not say this is an R2. This is a sketch for intuition. This is not a proof for intuition. So thank you for clarifying that. Not necessarily in R2, in R2 for the whole real thing for the actual problem, let me see. Okay, but then if we know these things are, in de are dependent, then somehow, well, okay, it makes sense actually, we should be able to draw a V3 as part of the span, but somehow we have to be using the earlier ingredient that the first two are linearly independent. Okay, follow up. What does it mean to be in the span? So we have to really define that, i.e show that V3 is equal to some constant, let's call it A times V1 plus B V2 for some, for some uh, A and B real numbers. Right. To be in the span means that you can be written as a linear combination of the, of the building block vectors. V1 and V2 are my building blocks. I'm allowed to combine them and scale them. And somehow I can get V3 out of that. Okay, so what do we know? 
we know how to write English. We know that, uh, let's call it I got numbers here, alpha V1 plus beta V2 equals zero. So I'm looking at these two by themselves. I'm looking at those two by themselves because I was told they were linearly independent. So that sum has only alpha equals zero, beta equals zero as a solution from the linear independence, while I'm running out of letters here. Uh, let's go C V1 plus D V2 plus E V3 equals zero has at least, sorry, has a solution. Get my order right here. Has a solution with at least one of C, D, and E not equal to zero. All right. So again, what are these two equations? Where are these coming from? This is the linear independence test, right? And so I should be adding a zero vector hat here. If we go for those. If I add up a combination of these vectors to get zero, I can, I can always do that. Because the right-hand side zero, I can always pick the two coefficients to be zero and it'll work for the equation. If that's the only solution then, that's when we say we've got a linear independent set. These two vectors somehow can't get me in a round trip back to zero. Whereas we were told that V3, V1, V1, V2, V3 together are linearly dependent. Well, that means there is some set of coefficients where at least one of them is not zero. And I can still get back to the zero vector by adding up that combination. So that's from our linear dependence. Dependent. All right. We're trying to combine these two known facts here, pardon me, these two known facts here to get this kind of equation here. So what we are really interested in is can I solve for V3? Where's an equation with V3? That's right here. So what I wanna focus on then is this coefficient E. Focus on E. Why? Because I wanna be able to isolate V3 and if I think about that equation for a second, actually, let's go this way. If I think about that equation, if, let's do the easy case, if E is not equal to zero in the solution, in the solution, so the solution right here, then, uh, then EV3 is equal to minus CV1 minus DV2, or, I can go over the page break. I apologize for you if you're following along. Uh, it's a little harder on paper. Or V3 is equal to minus C over E V1 minus D over E V2. And that's okay or safe because E is not zero. I'm not dividing by zero when I do this. And that means that V3 is a linear combination, combination of V1, V2, V1, V2, oh, I keep changing how I write my Vs. And so V3 is in the span of the set V1, V2. So this is great. If my E, so one of these values here has to be non-zero. If E is non-zero, at least one. If E is non-zero, I'm done because I can solve for V3 and V3 is in the span of what I worked on. What I have to worry about though is, well, what if I break down and what if E is not zero, or sorry, E is zero, does equal zero. That's not a word, that's not a sentence. So if E equals zero, I can't do any of this work I just did. I can't, be a, I can't write and solve for V3 safely. Uh, 
But fortunately, we have another fact we haven't used yet, which is a clue. If E is zero, then that would imply that we would have, uh, we'll have CV1 plus DV2 plus zero V3 equals zero, the zero vector, with one of C and D non-zero. Okay. All right. So if we have the case where E is zero, that means one of the other ones has to be non-zero. It seems kind of silly. Well, one of them has to be non-zero. We've excluded E, so it has to be C or D. But uh, the set V1, V2 is linearly independent. Why does that matter? Well, because if I put a zero in here, this term drops off. It doesn't play a role in the calculation at all anymore. And so the only C and D that satisfy, <laughs> satisfy CV1 plus DV2 equals the zero vector are C equals zero and D equals zero. That's contradiction. Contradiction. And how did we get down this far? We got to this contradiction by saying, hey, what? I wonder if E could be zero. Which implies that our assumption that E equals zero assumption can't be true. Assumption cannot be true. And so E is non-zero is the only uh, case, possible case. And that led to V3 being an element of the span of V1, V2. Up here, in the sky right here. We had to end up at this case here because the other possibility that, oh, what if that coefficient is non-zero was ruled out by the linear independence? Uh, okay. I'm just following the chat. It's adorable. Um, I just don't want a distraction. If people are easily distracted, uh, just ignore the chat for a while. All right. We will resume to linear algebra related questions afterwards. All right. So that would be a sample question. That is a sample question from a real honest to goodness midterm from 2019. Um, do you have to check for both cases? Absolutely. Because if you just, so one hypothesis would have been to go from this line here to say, oh, well, then V3 is equal to this because I can isolate it. Well, you are saying something about E when you do that. As soon as you divide by E, you're saying it's not zero. You have to rule that case out. Like, how do you know it's not zero? The only reason you know it's not zero is because of this logic. So there's no way to do this problem without exploring the two cases of, oh, okay, if E is positive or non-zero, that's fine. If it is zero, that, that would blow up what you did. So you have to investigate and say, well, why is that not a problem? Uh, no. So these two equations, the reason I picked different coefficients for them is because they're not directly compatible, right? They're like this has this, there's this equation, but there's all this stuff about it. It's not just an equation by itself. It's some properties about the coefficients that satisfy it. Here's another equation with V3 in it, which has different conditions on what's, what the solution has or what the solution values are for the coefficients. So there's no real way to add or subtract equations in a meaningful way here. You don't have any of the numbers. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know what that would look like. So it's really more a reasoning about, can you, so, given this equation here, can you solve for V3? Sure we can, so long as, oh wait, so long as I don't end up dividing by zero, Oh, how, what is, how do I bring that in? It, you have to bring in a separate equation. Um, good question. Factor out the minus. Uh, there's still a multiplier out front of this. Whatever this number here is, sorry, I'm just looking at Kyle's question. Um, 
if you solve for V3, it's not so much the negatives, it's that there's some number out here, you don't know what it is. And so if you're going to get, we have to have up here V3 equals something. So you have to be able to isolate V3. And the only way to isolate V3 is to remove that coefficient. And that is only safe if it was not, you can't, <laughs> sorry, just got lost my spiral there. Um, if this had been a zero, like for example, if we came along and said, oh yeah, yeah, this is, you know, three V1 plus two V2 plus zero V3 is equal zero. You wouldn't be able to solve this for V3, right? You can't isolate V3 if it's got a zero coefficient, you can try, but uh, it's gone already. Like it's not in the equation anymore. It's not apparent in this form here because it's just written as a letter, but it could be zero, right? The statement about linear dependence doesn't tell you anything about what these numbers are, which one is or is not zero. It just says one of them at least is not zero. So you need this other piece of information. It's not going to be just about solving or manipulating this equation. Somehow you have to bring in this other form to be able to, uh, to be able to fully go through this proof. So they're, they're all completely valid questions and concerns, but I cannot see any way other than this. Um, that's not taking, not a shortcut, uh, that's not taking or building in an assumption that isn't warranted without using the facts only that were given to you about the independence and dependence of the two sets and then working with the equations that define those conditions. Yeah. All right. So again, if that's feeling totally foreign at the moment, uh, do take a look back at the practice problems, send me an email, post some discussion forum posts on OnQ, whatever you feel is going to help you best get to the, I've got these concepts trembling around in my head and I need to get them down on paper somehow. I need to figure it out. Most of the things that we're doing typically come back to some kind of statement though, and manipulating that statement and then trying to work through consequences of values or the equation itself logically. So there's not a lot of building blocks that you have to work with. There's enough, there's enough. I mean, between vector spaces, vector subspaces, linear independence, but it's not pages and pages, like one page. And if you can try to figure out how you turn the words into a mathematical statement, and it's not just the equation, remember, it's the equation plus conditions in this case here, then I think that'll help you kind of piece together how these proofs are structured, especially if you look at the solutions for the tutorial problems and say the old exams, uh, once you get into the, into the pattern of them. All righty. So that is the end of what would be on the midterm. This new material here is not directly on the midterm. We're gonna be focusing on linear independence and dependence again, but specifically in the context of solving systems of equations. So last week, what we saw was that if we saw unknowns, so X1 and X2 here and X2, are the unknowns we want to solve for. To solve for. So, right. if, if we just given you this equation here on the left-hand side and said, solve it, you said, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I'm looking obviously for x1 and x2 that make all of these equations true or that satisfy all these equations. Then what we did to put a linear algebra spin on it was we factored those out. And if you take the X2 out of all these equations here and look at the coefficients, we have a three, we have a one, we have a minus one. Well, that's the same as X2 times the vector, three, one, minus one, if we stack our equations together. Our right-hand side is one, three, negative three. And this side here would be, oh, there's nothing there explicitly. That means it's a one multiplier. So we have a one, two, four times that. Oh, so these two systems are completely equivalent. If I can find an X1, X2 that solves this, that's the same as finding an X1, X2 that solves the, the equation on the right. Well, that then looks different and that gives us an insight. So this is X1, V1 plus X2, V2 equals some output, let's call it W. Oh, 
So does the system of equations have a solution? That is the same as is the right-hand side slash w in the span of the set v1, v2. Because this is my right-hand side, we just did a span question from the old exam. This is a vector that I'm getting. And if it's in the span, it means I can build a linear combination of the two v1, v2 vectors and build that vector v, or that vector w. So another way of saying is w is a linear combination of v1, v2. It usually makes sense for this. v2. All right. OK, well, how does that help us? Not a lot right now, but we're going to look at three cases, and we're going to break down what they mean over the next few pages. So what I'm going to be teasing out here is the number of solutions. So we've already got sort of zero solutions or some solutions. We're going to get one layer deeper here and see there's actually only three cases that can happen. So compare the number of solutions to the following systems. x1, da, 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 da. OK. How would we solve this? Well, we saw how we solve this. We go back and actually write equations. I'm going to take little shortcuts here because the numbers are nice. And what I'm going to see here, just looking at this first row, I have x1 plus 0x2s. So the first row here gives me the equation that x1 equals 0. All right. Then the second equation, if I just go through this, it has 0x1s. It has an x2. So it's going to be x2 equals 3. And then if I check the last one, x1 plus x2 equals 4, that's just not true. <laughs> so uh, I cannot add 0 and 3 and get 4. So this has no solution. No solution. OK. And so that would mean that the vector uh, 0, 3, 4, is not in the span of 1, 0, 1 and 0, 1, 1. That's what I just said. There's another way to take, another take we can ha get away from or take away from this kind of equation. Now, the next is a little more interesting. Uh, here we would get in the first line, we'd have x1 equals 1. The next line is uh, x2 equals 3. And the third line is, oh, this is much more promising. This is x1 plus x2 equals 4. Well, 1 plus 3 does equal 4, so that is actually fine. We can satisfy all these equations. But if I take a look at these first two lines, there's only two values that work here. It's Sorry, there's only one value that works. Uh, and there's no ambiguity. x1 has to be equal to 1. x2 has to be equal to 3. So here we get a single solution. Now, let's take a look at this third value here, this third setup. This one's a little less obvious because there's just more pieces involved. But we can do a little hunting through the equations here. And what we're going to see is that, oh, let's just do some samplings here. In practice, we do this in a more long form, but I'm trying to make a point in comparison here without belaboring all the calculations. But if I take one of these, and I think three of these, and none of these, let's try that. If I take one times one, plus three times zero, plus zero times one. OK, so if I get one, that gives me one. The next one is 3, oh, plus 0, that's 3. And 1 plus 3 is 4. Oh. So x1 equals 1, x2 equals 3, x3 equals 0 is a solution. OK, sure. I just randomly picked that out of the hat. You could have solved for it, but that's true. But if I take 0 of these, and this time, instead of 1, 
if I take, let's say, it's not like I did this ahead of time, uh, four of these and one of these, let's just make sure that works. Uh, zero times that doesn't matter. So four times zero plus one times one, that's one. Four times one minus one is three. Then four plus zero is, hey, but so is is uh, x1 equals 0, x2 equals 4, x3 equals 1. And that also gets a check mark. And as soon as we get two solutions from these things, we're going to get an infinite number of solutions. For linear equations, that'll be the rule. There are, there is, there are. infinite number of solutions. Okay. Who cares? So what? Equation's fine. We solve them. We get solutions, whatever. I'm going to put, if you look into your next slide, if you have it handy, those three examples are going to be reproduced. And now we're going to look at them from a vector perspective. So this is just solving equations, good old fashioned grade nine. As soon as you learn how to add and subtract equations, that's all this is. But now we're going to focus on the vectors and see what they can tell us about the story. So this first one here doesn't tell us much because it basically says what we already knew that zero, three, four is not in the span of 1, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 1. Okay, so that, if there's no solution, if I've got a right-hand side vector here, so the right-hand side, which equals that, is not in the span of the building blocks left-hand side, fine. The other two are more interesting. These two vectors here, because there's only two of them, it's pretty easy to see they're not multiples of each other. And so this set of 1, 0, 1 and 0, 1, 1 is linearly independent. And remember, the equation had exactly one solution. That's from the last page. Now, if we take a look at this bottom one here, it's less obvious, but if you take, but yeah, say we note that, uh, let's call these, these numbers here, V1, V2, V3, V1 minus V2 actually gives us V3. If I take this first, first vector here and I subtract the second one, I get one minus zero, that's one. 0 minus 1 is minus 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. Well, as soon as I have one vector in the set being a linear combination of the others, that means the set v1, v2, that's right, the it's time to for thoroughness and better parallelism. That means the set of 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and 1, negative 1, 0 is linearly nearly dependent. And in that case, our equation had an infinite number of solutions. That is new. That is something probably when the, when the mathematicians discovered this, they were probably like, oh, that was not what I was expecting. Notice both of these down here, uh, both have the right-hand side, right-hand side, try to read that, right-hand side in the span. So the first test is whether you can actually reach this right-hand vector. If you can, I'm oh, sorry, if you can reach that right hand vector with uh, your building block vectors, then you split into two cases. Either your building blocks are linearly independent, and that seems to lead to one solution, 
or your building blocks are linearly dependent, in other words, they can be combined to make mixtures of each other, then somehow that has a consequence that when we solve equations with those building blocks, we get an infinite number of solutions. Now we're going to tease some of that out. Um, so the nice thing about this is it's general, right? As soon as we have any set of equations that are linear, you notice know, it has to be linear, we can't have squareds and things like that. But anytime we have a set of linear equations, we can write it as this vector plus this vector with some multipliers out front equals some outside vector. Would the third case look like any specific in the 3D case? Yes. So we're going to talk about dimensionality and sketching. I think for this in a little bit, if you do want some context for these two ones here, everything is an R3 in the sense that these vectors are in R3. It's a little challenging because we have the Xs and then we have the vectors. The vectors are in R3. Two vectors, as you know now, defines a plane. There we go, plane. A uh, plane in the space. The right-hand side being the span means that you can actually reach that third vector. All three vectors, uh, v1, v2, and the output are in the same plane. And then we just find how many of each one of these gets us to that third one. It turns out to be exactly the same here. Because these are linearly dependent vectors, but they're not parallels, there's three vectors now in a plane, and I'm building a fourth vector that's also in that plane. That's what the geometric interpretation of these two scenarios would be. Up here, it would be a plane and some vector that's outside the plane that I can't reach with those building blocks. All right. Sorry, I had something more intelligent to say about this. I'm trying to remember what it was. All right. Um, yes, yeah, the translation here. So just for scale, we have a certain number of equations. And we have a certain number of unknowns. How does that translate into our spaces here? Well, the number of equations, each equation gives us one component, one component of the vectors that we're building. And so when we rewrite this out as a set of vectors being added together, and let's do P, X, P, V, P equals W, they're all vectors, so W, the V1 to VP and W are in our number of unknowns, sorry, number of equations. So P and the number of unknowns is still the same. All righty. That's all I'm going to say there. Yeah. So, yeah, just in terms of conversion factor, when we're moving from equations with unknowns, how does that play out in terms of the vector system that would be equivalent to it? It's this part here. That's not crucial. For us right now, I just want to look at this breakdown and formalize it in this very generic sense of sums of variables times vectors and talking about the solution. So if we have this kind of equation set up and we're trying to solve it, so goal is to solve for the x's. Well, if we tell, we are told or we figure out that W is not even in the span of the building block vectors on the left-hand side, right away, we know that there's no solution. Why? Because if W is not in the span, it means I cannot build a linear combination that gets me to W. So it's kind of the definition of being in the span. If we have W in the span, so is in the span, and now it doesn't matter what the dimensions are, it doesn't matter anything else. The set V1 to VP is linearly independent. That's all that matters. Then we're going to get exactly one solution for X1, X2, all the way up to XP. X2, 
exactly one solution. And not surprisingly here, if we have linearly dependent vectors, we're going to get an infinite number of solutions for x1, x2 to xp. OK, I will underline this for thoroughness. There we go. So if we're working with that kind of scenario, we now have a, a classification of linear systems that we didn't have before. And what it hinges on is something that's new for almost everybody in the class, this idea of sets of vectors and whether they are linearly dependent or independent. So this goes back to the question that was asked last week of which is better, an independent set or a dependent set? It's neither. It's just that if you see one, you get one result. If you see another one, you get another result. Sometimes you you want infinite numbers of solutions to a system. Sometimes you want just exactly one. Um, there's no, again, there's no judgment on this. It just tells you two different stories. It puts you in two different worlds and you deal with the world that you're, that you're working with. So um, yeah, so this is actually a pretty fun collection of things. What we're gonna do, I think we have the time, perfect, uh, is we're just gonna do the intuition and then we will save the proofs for this. Uh, Sorry, going back to the question there. The, it's not so much that the, it's not independent or dependent, they are because they're a set, but the dependence linear, uh, dependence, independence of the set V1 to VP is just irrelevant, <laughs> irrelevant to this question in this scenario. If you have a scenario where you're trying to build this vector W out of these building blocks and you can't do that, you don't care what the arrangement of the building blocks is. They can't get you, they can't build the skyscraper out of those building blocks and they don't care what they are. So the nature is irrelevant. It's only if you're in the span, then all of a sudden the independence or linear, linear independence or dependence matters more. All right. So we're gonna do this actually in R2. I said R3 and then I realized I was, all my diagrams ended up being in R2 anyway. So let's do this in R2 and let's just have one vector, one vector to start with V1 and I'm going to draw the, the W's here as points because again, they're, they're kind of like targets. We don't, I don't care about the origin so much, I just care about getting them to them. Uh, this line here is the span of V1. And so if we have a W that's not in the span, then, well, I just can't get there. There's no multiple of V1 that gets me there. Um, and that can be, yeah, that's really all it is. <laughs> Basically we can't get there from here. It gets more interesting when we have W in the span and we have linear independent and dependent. So let's draw that scenario out. Let's put W in the same place. And let's put our V1 here as well. So this will be one vector. Oh, sorry. Let's do one vector still, so it's possible. And it'll just be on the line now. So V1 goes like this. And so for this scenario, we have W is in the span of V1, V1's going this way already. We can take a multiple of it and get to W, great. But you'll notice there's a, there's a unique solution to that. Only one way to scale, scale V1 to get W. If it's this, it's like two. I've got V1 and I get two of them. Okay, so that's my scaling factor. I can't use three, I can't use 1.5. It's gotta be two, there's no ambiguity there. Even if I go to two vectors, so let's have our V1, let's have them point in different directions now. V1 and V2. And let's put our W up in the same place. Well, I can get to W by some combination of V1, and some combination of V2 scaled. So this would be 
A times V1, this would be B times V2, and I add them together, I get to W. But again, you can kind of feel that linear independence. If I go down the V1 direction to get to W, this, I have to go this much because V2 only goes in one direction, it goes that way. And so there's no other way to get to W by slightly altering how much of the two ingredients that we have. So here, uh, again, unique combination of V1, V2 to reach W. Okay. Notice it's not the number of vectors that matters. We just have to be in the span to start with, but we already know that. That's kind of the default assumption for this case. But if I have one vector, it's linear independent, I can get to W. Okay, there's only going to be one way to do it. If I have two vectors that are linearly independent and I can get to W, well, there's only one way to do that. What happens when we have linear dependent cases? Well, that can actually happen in a whole bunch of ways. Linear dependence is a broader set. Let's put W up here again. W, W, W. All right. So if I have one vector, and if I have two vectors, and if I have three, oh, let's go three. You'll see the point after three. All right, if I have one vector, linearly dependent, wait, think about the theorems we proved last week. If we have only one vector and it's not zero, then we can't have this. If you have a single vector that's non-zero, it's always gonna be linearly independent. So cannot have, one non-zero vector also linearly dependent. That's just not possible. Okay. Okay. So then if I have two vectors, what would that look like? Well, one vector, they have to, I'm saying it's in the span. So I want to have a vector like that. So I can reach W, like follow this out of W. Let's move that over a little bit. There we go. And let's add a second vector. If it's linearly dependent though, and I have two vectors, then it must be in the same direction or some multiple of it. Let's call that V2 then, V2, V1. They have to be in a line because we're saying they're linearly dependent. So what does that mean? Well, great, how do I get to W? Well, I can follow V1 two times, or I could follow V1 four times and then go back with V2 some or I could follow V1 six times and go back with two V2s. There are multiple ways to combine these ingredients to get back to W. So multiple, in fact, infinite, multiple ways to combine V1, V2, V2 to reach W. And again, it's because of this, I can get, I can cancel out the effect of one of my vectors, say my V1, with some V2s, or I can cancel out some V2s with some V1s. That's what linear dependence captures. And that's what we're using now as an extra ingredient for interpreting as a solution or ways to reach points or solve linear systems of equations, systems of linear equations. Now, it's even more interesting, I think, when we have something like this, where we have three vectors, like let's go back to the V1, V2 we had a second ago, V1, V2, those are literally independent. But if I add a third vector to that mix, doesn't matter which direction I pick, let's go here, go V3, sorry, V3, V3. Notice these three vectors are all in a plane and I can get to V3 by adding V1s and V2s together, or I can get V2 by adding uh, how would I do that? By taking negative V1 plus some V3, or I can make V1 by doing, so again, it's, the, it's intermingling. It's not like one is extra. I can make, in this case here, any of the three out of the other two. Now, the fun part is if you go meta here for a second, remember that we can add these three vectors together and get zero. The linear uh, dependence condition is that way. if I take AV1, plus BV2 plus CV3 equals the zero vector. That means that I can follow some V1, follow some V2, and then follow V3 backwards and get to 
the origin. And that means I can always add cycles by just having more and more and more of each of these things. And how does that play out for our solutions? Well, it means, let's take V1 and V2 here. I can do some V1 and then I can do some V2s. So AV1 plus BV2 and get to W. That's maybe one way to do it. But then what I can do is I can stay there by taking more V1s and some V2s and some V3s, V1s, V2s, and V3s with some other constants. And I can loop back to the W. So that's another solution. I take this much V1, this much V2, and then a bunch of these guys. Or I could do that on a bigger scale, or I could do it with like half multipliers, or I could do it the other way. The fact that I can add things up with these three vectors and get the zero vector and basically add nothing to this whole scenario means that I can reach V, I can reach this W point in not just one way, but two ways or three ways or five ways. I can do it in an infinite number of ways. So, and again, it didn't have to be this first two. I could have started off from the origin and followed V2 for a while. I'd have to think about this for a sec. Uh, yeah, I would follow V3 for a while and V2 backwards. So there would have been some other starting point too that we could have picked. So in general, you can feel that because of this linear dependent, there's some kind of way I can keep coming back to my point with different combinations of the initial vector. You now scaled versions, not just random picks, but if I choose it correctly, if I choose it so it's perfectly balanced, I can end up getting back to the same point with a number, an infinite number of different roots. So this one here has an infinite number of roots that end at W. And that's an infinite number of solutions to the equation. It's an infinite because it's the solutions are how many of each of these vectors am I keeping? Number of solutions. All right. I think that is a lovely place to stop because we're actually 1222. Uh, so that'll conclude the end of our video for today. And if there's any questions, I saw some in the chat, I'll answer those. And I'm happy to answer questions about this or about any of the week one to four material that you are presently studying before the midterm.